Uh, next up, we have Smia talking about real penetration testing. Please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Mia, and today I will be talking about how to hack a butt plug. Uh, this is one of those, uh, just FYI. I don't know if you've ever seen one in person. I have not. Um, but I've been introduced to a lot of things over the past two years, so, you know, here we are. Uh, you might be wondering, what, is it like, what does it even mean to hack a butt plug? Because, you know, if, if you take a look at this, it's basically just like a piece of silicone. Obviously, you're supposed to put it somewhere. Um, there's not much to it, right? You don't really need uh, any electronics in your butt. Over the past couple of years, uh, or a couple of years, I mean, like, past few decades, even, actually, there's been uh, the emergence of this uh, new field called uh, teletodonics. Uh, look at the etymology for this. Uh, you know, it's from the Greek tele, which means from afar, uh, and the English dildo, which apparently just means dildo. There's no origin. I tried to look it up. Uh, no one knows where this word came from. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory, right? The idea is that you want to make sex toys that are controllable remotely uh, in, in some way. Uh, it actually, uh, you know, enables a number of different scenarios. Um, basically, <laughs> I, just, I just want to explain to you because not everyone is familiar with this field. Okay, I just want to explain how this works. Uh, so you take this blood plug, right? Uh, you insert it, uh, and, and from there you're, you're actually able to like control it from uh, from your phone, uh, your phone, from your laptop, from any kind of device. Really. So that's that's the first scenario. Second scenario is like technically kind of the same thing. It's just you end up in control to you know someone else. Uh, no, this is, a, this is an actual thing, um, and, and so they actually advertise this for like, oh, you can like go up to the bar and like no one will know. Uh, it's kind of fun, uh, but technically it's like the exact same thing. It's just it opens up, you know, a new kind of attack scenario because you're giving control over to possibly a stranger or you know someone else, uh, which just changes the threat model here. Uh, the third scenario is going to be the same thing: you give control over to someone else, but this time it's going to be over the internet. Um, and you, can, you know, you can kind of think of that as it's probably not going to be a stranger, but it might be. Uh, it's going to be enabling uh, people in long distance relationships possibly to, to have some fun, which is pretty cool. Um, but but the real where the real money is is actually with using this uh, as as a sexual. <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to make a joke. That it's like people actually do rely on these uh, on these on these things as, as tools to make a living, right? Um, and in my opinion, this actually is uh, something that kind of gives some legitimacy to this research because, you know, I'm just hacking butt plugs. Yes, it's funny, but people do actually make a livelihood off of this, right? Uh, it's like some scenarios are going to be, you know, cam girls, cam boys, uh, whatever you want to call them, people who uh, basically provide dynamic, you know, sex entertainments uh, over the internet uh, are getting paid to have people watch them and they sometimes have the ability to, you know, get paid to give control over to their sex toy. Um, they, the company that makes this butt plug actually has a patent on the concept of tipping money over the internet to control a butt plug, um, which, you know, that's a whole other debate, but it's kind of interesting. The, one of the scenarios also is that you can, you can either, yeah, uh, have it vibrate in exchange for, you know, a $5 tip or something, but it can also be you create a link to control your butt plug and you give it out to someone on Twitter or someone on whatever. Um, just to get them control for a limited amount of time. Uh, so people actually do, you know, rely on these as tools for their work. So it's kind of important, in my opinion, to take a look at what the security posture is here. Uh, and so the security posture, like, let's think about scenarios that are interesting for, for us in, in terms of hacking these butt plugs. One of them is just going to be okay. Well, you're, you're using this locally, and someone is within the vicinity notices that you have a butt plug in and tries to hijack that connection. Uh, there's actually already been a bunch of research into this, so it's not going to be our primary fork in the focus here, uh, but it's definitely a scenario that is kind of interesting. Uh, we will note that you know doing this might technically be sexual assault. I don't know. Uh, it's problematic. Please don't do it. Whether it's legal or not, just don't be a dick. Uh, second scenario that's kind of interesting is going to be... Uh, is going to be uh, looking at doing the exact same thing, but remotely, right? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, in some cases, uh, especially if you're making money off of this, you might be giving control over to from of your sex toy to a complete stranger. Uh, what does that mean? Are they going to be able to, you know, compromise your, your devices or compromise your butt plug or do whatever, do something bad? Uh, so that's a compromise scenario that's totally legit and, uh, and more interesting, in my, in my opinion, uh, and kind of what we're going to be focusing on. Uh, and the third compromising scenario uh, would be the opposite, uh, thinking about having someone who has a hostile butt plug, basically, uh, who 
might be able to hack back into your computer or to your phone or whatever, and then possibly hack into whoever is connected on the other end. Uh, which is the other scenario that I don't think people realize this is a real risk of, you know, the hostile web plugs in this world. So this is something that we will be exploring. Taking a look in practice, uh, now that we've you know, introduced the whole world of teledesonics, what does it look like in practice? Uh, this is the Levin's Hush, uh, which I'll be doing a live demo on later on, just FYI. Uh, it's built as the world's first teledesonic web plug. Uh, as mentioned, it's a bug plug. Uh, I'm going to just be saying web plug a lot in this talk, just FYI. Uh, and you can control it from your phone, as an iOS app, an Android app, you can control it from your computer, it works on Mac OS and Windows. Uh, and on Windows, you actually do need to use a special USB dongle, which I will show you, but it's plugged into my computer right now. Uh, so that dongle is made by Relevance, so it's a company that these, these butt plugs, and, uh, and yeah, it's like $5, it's kind of interesting to kind of look into that. Uh, and then, you know, the app actually introduces uh, social features, you can uh, chat, video chat, uh, send pictures, and then obviously give control to your butt plug over to someone else. So in terms of the you know kind of like the threat map uh, in my mind, uh, this is what it looks like if you're thinking about the PC app. Uh, so you have a VLE connection between the butt plug and the uh, dongle, and then the dongle obviously is connected with USB uh, and so on, right? Uh, so the question here is, what can you, what does it look like for each compromise scenario? With? Well, for the local case, it's just compromise scenario one. Just want to compromise that VLE connection. Uh, again, there's already been research in this. Uh, basically, there's no security there. Anyone can uh, kind of just hijack a connection. There was a great talk last year uh, about a tool called BTLE Jack, which you can just totally uh, use to take over this. So that's not what we're going to focus on. Um, the second uh, kind of uh, uh, scenario for compromise was over the internet, so it would be kind of hijacking that connection somewhere, or thinking about uh, seeing how you can uh, compromise one app from the other. And the third scenario uh, is going to be trying to hack into the butt plug, trying to hack into the dongle, trying to hack into the app, each from one to the other. Uh, and so that actually involves a lot more research. The uh, question is, you know, this is a butt plug, obviously it's, well, I mean, not obviously, there is actually an open source uh, butt plug project, apparently. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not making a joke, it's apparently good work. Um, and uh, so the question is, well, where do we start, right? I, I, I started working on this, and I was like, well, I don't, I don't have the code for a butt plug, I don't have the code for the, the dongle, so what do I do? Well, PC app, you can just download it and put it into IDA and see what happens. Um, turns out you actually don't even need to put it to IDA, because of course it's a multi-platform uh, app, it works on both Windows and Mac OS, so of course it's an Electron app, so of course everything is written out in JavaScript. I don't love JavaScript, uh, but the nice thing about it is that it does end up uh, still having a bunch of variable names, uh, a bunch of uh, field names for these objects. Uh, so it is kind of you know easy to reverse engineer. Uh, it is obfuscated, but you can just throw it into a beautifier and try to figure out how things are going. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so once you've done that, you can just kind of like start looking for how the dongle works. Uh, turns out it's just a serial port connection over USB. Um, and, and that uh, allows you to start then sniffing the connection between the dongle and uh, the app. And one thing that you will notice, uh, the uh, sniffing uh, data is on the right here, is that all these messages being sent between the dongle and the, and the computer app are all in JSON. Uh, which is kind of interesting because, well, JSON is obviously you know, native for JavaScript apps and stuff, so that's convenient. However, for a USB dongle, it's just basically a 32-bit you know, microcontroller, it's kind of weird to have to embed a JSON parser with it. And for us, it's a good thing, though, because JSON parsers, uh, you know, it's a parser. There will probably be a bug in there. It turns out there is a bug in there. Uh, but it's kind of annoying to, uh, to take a look at that without having the code of the, of the actual dongle. Uh, however, since we do have the code of the app, we can take a look at the update mechanism because they have uh, firmware updates for the uh, USB dongle. From there, you can find the URL from which to down download that firmware and uh, download it and see if it's encrypted or signed or anything. Uh, turns out it's none of these things, so you can just grab it, uh, unzip it, uh, throw it to IDA, and uh, see what it looks like. Uh, from there, you can kind of notice that, yeah, it's, it's fun code, um, so it's pretty, pretty classic uh, yeah, ARM firmware code. Uh, throw it to IDA, you can kind of see how it looks, start reverse engineering. Notice, you notice two things. Um, first thing is it has two command handlers over USB, uh, USB serial. One of them is like these simple commands, uh, such as reset, like asking for device type, stuff like that. The other one is it basically, if it doesn't find a, uh, a simple command, it's going to throw it to a JSON parser, which is what we expected. Uh, that's where we can start looking for bugs. One thing that is interesting is uh, in the process simple commands uh, function is that it does have a command for DFU, uh, so that's the device firmware update. So as expected, we do actually have the ability to, uh, to send these uh, commands and get it into uh, uh, firmware update mode. 
But looking into the JSON parser, which is uh, what we're interested in here, uh, of course, we ended up finding a bug. Uh, the bug is in this function called parse JSON string. Um, and uh, basically, uh, that function is just supposed to allocate a new buffer, copy the initial string into, the, uh, the, into that new buffer, while also handling things like escape sequences. Um, the problem is, uh, the way that it works is first, it you know, calculates the, the length of the new buffer that it's going to allocate, then allocates it, and then does that copy. And so, of course, there's a mismatch between uh, the length that it calculates and the length that it's going to uh, actually use in, at, at the end there. Uh, the way that it works is that it supports um, you know, the uh, U escape character sequence, uh, which takes five parameters instead of just you know, zero, as, uh, as it expects. Uh, and so because of that, we're actually able to kind of escape the uh, null terminator and make it such that the uh, string length that was calculated first is, uh, is wrong. This is the little animation here. What's going on here is that it starts calculating the length, it runs into this escape character, so it skips the character, and then it finds null, uh, null terminator, and that's the string, uh, string length that it's calculating. Then, in this loop that actually copies into that buffer, what happens is it runs into the escape character uh, sequence. So it says, okay, there's a backslash, there's a U, that means that I need to skip six characters. And so it's actually skipping over the uh, null terminator, which is a problem. And then it just kind of keeps going, and it's going to be copying all these characters into that buffer, which is only six bytes in length. So obviously there's a problem, we can uh, overflow out of, the, out of this buffer, and uh, kind of just get code execution that way. This is great. Uh, we do have this bug. At this point, we don't actually know uh, what the hardware is running. We don't know, you know uh, if it has dev or anything like that, which uh, kind of complicates um, exploitation. So we do know there's no ASLR. There's no stacker keys, so it's basically hacking like 1999, assuming there's no dev, which is pretty cool. Uh, turns out the sock is just a Nordic Semiconductor sock, a uh, very classic uh, sock using uh, a bunch of uh, DLE IoT devices. Uh, the nice thing is they also left us a bunch of debugging pads so we can just connect to it, solder a couple things, and all of a sudden we can just debug this, uh, this dongle, which is pretty great. Being able to debug the dongle, we can kind of dump the, the contents of the heap, see what's there. Turns out the heap is only used for the uh, JSON allocators, uh, the JSON parser, so that's not super great, but it does also include uh, metadata. So what you're going to see here is that uh, for each allocation, you have a length field as well as a uh, as a uh, next pointer for the free list, assuming the allocation is been free. Uh, so the easy thing here is that yes, we can use our overflow to corrupt a length field, uh, put it to be zero, that way, um, and, and then corrupt the, uh, the next pointer field. That way the next allocation, assuming the pointer field points to uh, a non-zero, like a big enough value, uh, will be you know, placed there. Uh, and since we can place the allocation there, and then uh, copy a new string into it, it's very easy for us to, um, to use this to basically write arbitrary data in arbitrary location. We can do this, we'll the debugger uh, connected, and as you can see on the right here, uh, we, we have the stack basically is being dumped, and the stack has been completely overridden with just eight characters. Uh, that gives us code execution on the USB dongle, and uh, it's pretty cool. Um, from there, uh, we unfortunately remember that there was a DFU mode on the dongle all along. Uh, and the DFU mode, you know, I wouldn't expect, coming from a video game hacking uh, background, I expected the DFU, like the device firmware update mode, to just kind of, you know, authenticate the update in any possible way. Turns out, it kind of does with a CRC16, uh, which, if you know anything about crypto, is not any kind of authentication. I don't think that they actually wanted to have authentication there, they just kind of figured that, well, who cares about getting, you know, code execution on a USB butt plug dongle? Uh, turns out I do. Uh, so that's unfortunate. Uh, but it is, it is uh, interesting at, at this point, basically we have two different ways of getting code execution on this dongle. Uh, and the, the JSON parser way, you know, I, that I mentioned that we spent a lot of time on it, might not seem very useful because we have the device firmware update bit in mode, but it turns out it's actually going to come up again later with, uh, with another vulnerability that we're going to chain together. So, you know, I, I didn't just say all that for nothing. Point is, we can get code execution, uh, we can flash on the firmware, which is pretty great. So at this point we have a compromised USB dongle from the PCI, which is like, yeah, that was definitely the easiest part. Um, from here, what we want to do, since we have control of the dongle in theory, we should uh, be able, well, we want to like figure out a way to somehow get code execution on the butt plug, because you know, that's kind of what we do. Um, looking at the hardware on the butt plug, uh, it turns out that you know, there was a debugger on the dongle, so it might make sense to take a look at it. Uh, it's a very similar sock. Uh, so it's another Nordic semiconductor sock. Uh, it's a little beefier. It's an M4 instead of an M0. It has more flash, has more RAM, it's pretty great. 
Um, but it is the same technology, basically, uh, just more public state. Um, so the, the nice thing is, yeah, we can't, we can expect that there won't be any debt, there won't be any like more advanced medications on the, on the dongle, so it's pretty easy. But there's a bunch of other things that were not on the, uh, the USB dongle board, but there are a few things that were, which is the SWD uh, test points, so with that we can actually debug a butt plug. And this is what it looks like in practice. Uh, I'm kind of terrible at soldering, but I do have a bunch of butt plugs like this that are opened uh, in my bag. Uh, uh, so, you know, I, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but this is pretty cool. Uh, from there, uh, the nice thing about being able to debug a butt plug is that you can actually use this to dump the firmware. Uh, and from there, you know, kind of figured that if the dongle update mode was so insecure, uh, maybe the, you know, maybe the butt plug also had an update mode, which is also super secure. Uh, it turns out that yes, it does. If you send it the same, the exact same DFU command that you sent the dongle, it will also go into device firmware update mode. And from there, there's actually an app that uh, Nordic ships, which is the NRF toolkit app, uh, or toolbox app, and will just let you flash new firmware to it. Uh, at this point, we don't actually know if the DFU mode is uh, as insecure as the dongle. Uh, it could have been that they implemented uh, you know, asymmetrical keys uh, to, uh, to kind of uh, authenticate the firmware. Of course, fortunately for us, they didn't. Uh, so you can just kind of dump the, the butt plug firmware from, uh, from SWD, modify it, compute the new CR16, and send it over. And this way you can see on, on the right here is uh, you have Wireshark, uh, a little Wireshark. Uh, uh, trace there that kind of just see uh, has uh, the uh, the butt plug sending back uh, a little message saying hello from plug, uh, which means that yes, we obviously we just got credit on the butt plug by not even doing anything. There's no vulnerability here. It's just just kind of by design you can uh, reflash it, which might be Levinson's attempt to like open up to the open source community. It's possible. It's unlikely. But the point is, anyone who can connect to your butt plug at this point can get credit on it, um, which seems kind of dangerous. At this point, we do still require uh, being local, like being in the, the uh, physical vicinity of the butt plug to get credit on it. So it's probably not as big a deal as, uh, as we want it to be, but it's still a good question of being like, okay, we have credit on the butt plug, what can we do with this? Well, there's a few ideas that they had. The first one is if you can get credit on the butt plug, you can actually create butt plug ransomware. Uh, <laughs> modify that firmware, you make it such that the DFU mode can't be enabled until uh, you give it a certain key or something, and then you, you know you just disable all the code that creates vibrations, and if you have your own ransomware, you can ask maybe for like 50 bucks to unlock it and protect it from future uh, butt plug ransomware, uh, kind of butt plug vaccine, if you will. Uh, so this is a, one scenario that could work. Another scenario that is kind of interesting, but I did not really look into it that much, is the idea of like weaponizing the butt plug or any other sex toy like physically. Um, and you know, in the case of butt plug, it really just has one motor and uh, a little battery. Well, like a pretty big battery actually, like I guess probably 80% of the butt plug is a battery. So the question is, you know, I don't know if you remember like what happened with all these uh, Samsung Galaxy Note phones. They were like just kind of blowing up. Well, it, it might, you know, possibly be possible to, you know. <laughs> Again, I'm not an electrical engineer. I don't know if this is actually possible. It probably isn't, but if it was, this would be bad. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to assume that this is not possible, but it's something that is worth thinking about because you do have actually a lot of other sex toys that have other um, other things in the motor, right? Uh, you have sex toys that apparently have, I was looking at the code of the app uh, and uh, looking at all the different commands that work for different sex toys. There's a command that, is, says, that just says rotate. So clearly there's some kind of moving part in this uh, sex toy. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, maybe maybe there's like a safety feature for that motor that is actually encoded in the software, right, instead of in the hardware. So getting code execution on it could have uh, bad consequences. Same thing, I think there's like another sex toy that has some kind of uh, air pump, uh, which seems dangerous, but I don't actually know if it could be uh, problematic. So it's something that's worth looking into. And finally, we do have our last thing, which is the hostile butt plug. Hostile in terms not of, you know, exploding your butt, but as much as uh, kind of trying to hack into your other devices. Uh, so that is something that's worth thinking about, and that's what we're going to be looking into. It's like, okay, we have code execution on this, we know we can do here ransomware, but can we start hacking other devices from our butt plug? Of course the answer is going to be yes, but for now I'm going to pretend that we don't know that. 
So, uh, interestingly, uh, well, at this point, we have code execution on the bug plug. We have to figure out if we can get code execution in the app from that bug plug. So, doing that is as simple as trying to look into the uh, the way that the app kind of handles incoming messages, right? Uh, so, the first thing, so this is like a callback on the left uh, in JavaScript. Uh, I guess this is how it works to talk over uh, serial ports in uh, an Electron app. Uh, and what it does is it gets n, n is like the incoming data, uh, throws it into, a, well, it, it, it casts it to a string, and then throws it to a bunch of different functions. The first function is find dongle, which basically just handles uh, one of the initialization messages that comes from the dongle. Uh, the second one is on data, so this is like the actual main uh, command uh, response. Uh, handling loop, uh, handling function, uh, and what it does is, yeah, it takes this incoming JSON blob, uh, which can only be up to 32 characters in length. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm not sure why I didn't mention that earlier. It's going to come up in just a few minutes. Um, so it, it's just going to parse that and it's going to then use it to do whatever. Uh, it doesn't actually do a lot of processing on this. Uh, on, on this, it's just going basically going to like start compare it to something, and be like, oh, what's your status? Like, what's your um, how? What's your battery uh, life and stuff like that. Uh, and the last function that it calls into is actually much more interesting for us. Uh, it's surprisingly, it's much more interesting. So, uh, I called it debug log. It doesn't really have a name in the actual code. But what it does is it logs the uh, whatever's incoming, like the serial data. It throws it to the console.error uh, function. Uh, so it prints it out to a uh, to console as, a, as an error message for some reason. But what it also does is it creates a new DOM element, like an HTML element, and it throws the entire contents that it just received over serial into that element as HTML. Uh, now, I'm not a web dev, but if you are, you will probably think that this is a massive uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability from a bug plug dongle. Uh, so from there, basically, if you have control of the dongle and you can send anything over a serial, you can actually get the Electron app to interpret that anything as being HTML. Uh, that's problematic because HTML uh, will have the ability to spawn uh, new JavaScript code and new JavaScript code in an Electron app, uh, basically it's just, yeah, you just compromise the, the computer because there's no sandbox or anything. So the question is, can we actually do that with our limitation of having only 32 characters at a time? Uh, turns out, yes, absolutely, you can absolutely do that. One of the uh, ways of doing it is what I was showing on the, on, on the right up there. Uh, you have an, uh, an image uh, tag with a source that doesn't exist, and then you have the on-error callback, which is going to be called whenever the whenever it can actually be loaded. And so the screenshot is showing that plugging in this malicious dongle is going to allow you to uh, execute JavaScript code in the app. So it's problematic. Uh, it's kind of annoying to get a huge payload just because of, um, of the fact that we can only do 32 characters at a time. It's entirely possible. So at this point, we've actually compromised the app from the USB dongle. So we're halfway there to kind of make it back to from, from our bug plug to the app, which is pretty cool. Um, Now, of course, the questions. Uh, because you know what the dongle does essentially is just act as a little bridge between the dongle, uh, between the bug plug and the app. Uh, the question is whether we can just do use the exact same vulnerability to uh, compromise the uh, the app from the bug plug directly. Unfortunately, the answer to that is no, and the reason is that we have another uh, character length limitation on the messages that are coming from uh, from the bug plug to the to, uh, to, to the app. The way it does uh, does this is on the right you have this code that is in the uh, that is in the uh, the dongle uh, dongle firmware. What it does is just, just grabs incoming data. If it sees that it's more than 20 characters, it just kind of cuts it there and copy it, uh, copies it into a new buffer. Now a new buffer is actually on the stack, and uh, one of the there's actually a vulnerability there, which is that they don't uh, null terminate the, the, that string. So if you're able to place some uninitialized data after the string, you can actually send more than 20 characters up to the up to the app. Uh, unfortunately, I did not find a way to actually exploit this, but it is a it is kind of vulnerability, so it's, it's worth keeping in mind. <laughs> so, the uh, problem here is, yeah, we can't actually use this to get code execution directly on the app from the bug plug, which is kind of sad. But, uh, well, it's kind of sad for one thing. Uh, what's also kind of sad is that if you took a look at that code there, it basically doesn't really do anything with the input. It literally just copy pastes it into a new string and sends that new string up. So we can't really find it, uh, any kind of uh, of uh, you know um, memory corruption vulnerabilities in the actual bug plug specific code. However, uh, one thing that's pretty cool is that there's way more code on this microcontroller than just the bug plug specific code that was written by Elevens. There's also this whole uh, soft device region, which is at the bottom of memory, so this piece at zero. 
Um, and so what this sock device is, is basically a driver for that sock that was written by uh, Northern Semiconductors themselves. And so it's going to contain everything that you need to device the interface with the hardware without having to rewrite everything yourself. And so that's going to include the BLE stack, uh, so all the code that is going to handle the Bluetooth wire energy protocol. Uh, and so it might be possible for us to take a look at that, kind of reverse engineer it, because obviously it's not open source, and uh, find a vulnerability in the Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth low energy stack. That's just what we did uh, in order to hack a plug, finding Bluetooth vulnerabilities. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, so because we, we can kind of debug it, um, debug that uh, upload or, or the, the normal firmware, it's actually really easy to kind of just like follow the uh, flow of data because there's also no SLR and then it's really easy to define the code that is going to be handling those messages. Uh, and on the right here, we actually have one of those functions that handles these incoming messages um, for the uh, general attribute protocol um, for, for central mode uh, messages, I guess. Um, and so uh, what, what I'm showing specifically is actually uh, the uh, handler for, uh, for one, of the, uh, very, uh, one of the specific commands in the, that protocol, which is uh, the read by type uh, command, uh, which as I understand it, because I'm not really a Bluetooth expert, uh, it's something that is going to allow you to kind of request uh, reading uh, attribute handle uh, you know, data pairs back from uh, back from uh, back from the device so essentially you, you ask read by type to your peripheral device uh, giving it a certain type that is going to return all the handles for all, all the attribute services that are you know um, associated with that type uh, so that, what that means is that it's possible for it to uh, actually receive more than one attribute at a time, and the size of each attribute, uh, handle attribute, a data pair, is encoded as a field inside of the packet. That means that we can actually control it. Now, if you look at the code, uh, what it was doing in that, um, what it was doing in that function, is that it has allocated on the stack a uh, fixed length buffer uh, for the uh, attribute data. And that fixed length buffer is going to uh, have, be a struct basically that has just the handle value and then a pointer to the data associated with that handle. So that's what you can kind of see with these uh, little arrows there. Is that, can I show you? Uh, oops, if you, you have these little arrows there, is that you, you're gonna have in, at the bottom left there, uh, that's the actual binary, like the uh, hex data that is inside of that buffer. And so you have the, uh, the uh, 0xd handle and then a pointer that points to that data, like the data blue bit associated with it. And then the same thing for the second handle and third handle. And because uh, it's on the stack, uh, oh, actually, never mind, that's not set, it needs to be set. So, Vulnerability here, uh, if you read the code a little bit, what you're gonna see is that, yeah, it reads that little uh, purple field, uh, link field from the, uh, from the incoming message, so that's completely controlled by a potential attacker, and if we look at what happens if we place uh, value zero there, basically you end up with an un unbounded uh, infant loop. Uh, so that loop is, sorry. Because it's unbounded, it doesn't actually check that the, the data that's writing into the output buffer is within the output buffer. We have a very uh, classic uh, stack smash kind of vulnerability, which obviously is very unfortunate because on these devices, once you can smash the stack because there's no stacker keys or you know ASLR or dev or anything, you basically immediately have code execution. In this case, the problem is uh, because you have uh, value zero there. Uh, in this specific case, it's actually going to be a completely infinite loop, so you're just going to overwrite all the data in RAM with garbage. Uh, which is kind of unfortunate because that's definitely going to crash and not going to be useful. But if you think about using value one, it actually is going to be bounded by the number of bytes that are inside of the incoming message. And what that means is that you're going to be able to uh, overflow ever so slightly from that buffer and uh, then from there, uh, because the stack uh, buff, uh, buffer that is based on the stack, you're going to be able to corrupt everything that's near it. So taking a look at before, uh, what, what happens when you do actually use this uh, overflow on the stack in yellow is going to be the attribute buffer that I was mentioning. Then in blue is going to be a bunch of save registers and uh, orange is actually the return address. So that's kind of things that you would want to be uh, corrupting on the stack. And then you run this, uh, run the vulnerability. It's going to overwrite all this data on the stack with, uh, in this case, completely, well, it's going to write two things, right? It's going to write the handle data, which is actually only overwriting the, the, lower, the, the less significant bytes of, uh, of, uh, of D words every uh, eight bytes, and then it's going to be writing a bunch of pointers to data that we control. So this is actually a pretty useful primitive for us. We can just kind of start corrupting everything. We can corrupt the return address with a pointer that points inside of our packet. 
Uh, and that's really great because uh, basically that means that as soon as the function is going to return, it's going to execute code that is you know placed inside of our packet. Uh, so it's basically it's basically a backdoor pa uh, packet if you think about it. It's going to just execute a piece of code and give it without really doing a lot of fuss, which which is pretty cool. Um, Thing is, uh, you know, the Cortex, Cortex M0 CPU actually does not support ARM mode, so we do have an alignment um, uh, requirement on that return address. It has to be, uh, you know, aligned to two plus one, basically. Uh, so that is one problem because if you look in this specific case, what was overwritten on the uh, stack is actually not aligned to that boundary. So this would actually crash, uh, which is not great. There's another uh, requirement that we have, which is that there are saved uh, registers of like actually uh, like local variables that are overwriting on the way over that are used on the return path of this function. Uh, one of them specifically is actually uh, used to be dereferenced at a 32-bit bi uh, binary uh, boundary. Uh, and so what happens is that if it's not actually uh, aligned, it's just going to crash. So that's another thing that we have to take into account. And basically, that means that we, we're going to have to slide this uh, packet over in the way that it's allocated if we want to have any hope of it actually being exploitable. Fortunately, that's really easy because the way that uh, the uh, soft device allocates these incoming packets is in some kind of ring buffer with absolutely no um, uh, enforcement of any kind of alignment uh, requirements. Uh, and so what that means is that if I send a packet a certain length before or after, I can control the alignments of this packet that I'm going to be sending afterwards. So this is what you're kind of seeing in, in yellow and in blue are two packets that are being sent before the uh, exploit packet is sent. And so that, so that allows me to control the alignment of that last packet and make it such that it is uh, correctly uh, aligned and not crashing, which is what we want. From there, the way that you actually exploit this to get code search in the way that's useful and not just, you know, uh, exploiting, well, not just executing two, um, uh, two instructions and then returning is that I send the first packet, which is going to contain a bunch of shellcode. Then I send um, another uh, packet that's going to contain a bunch of data. Another packet that's going to be containing a lot of data. Uh, both of these are going to be used by the shellcode. And then a third packet, which is going to be the one that actually triggers the vulnerability. Uh, the way that it works is that the one that triggers the vulnerability is going to uh, execute a single instruction, which is what you see that C1, uh, E7 instruction there. Uh, what that does is it jumps back into the green uh, allocation, into the green packet, uh, and then that one is going to execute this very simple piece of code, which is still loads a bunch of registers from the, uh, thing, the blue packet, and then it's going to uh, use that to call into a function, return cleanly, and then we can just send that packet over again. So that allows me to basically, by sending four packets, execute any arbitrary tiny piece of code within that uh, <laughs> within that uh, remote dongle, and then return and you know do that over and over again. Which is very convenient because that way I can actually just call to memcopy and uh, over and over and do that to copy a larger shellcode binary, and then we're going to jump into it, and that allows us to execute uh, a lot more code. So at this point, we actually just have completely compromise this, we just need to write this shellcode. And so, because we want our uh, compromise to be uh, permanent, basically we're just going to write a little piece of shellcode that's going to overwrite a piece of flash, uh, let us hook, in, uh, hook into the uh, original dongle code, and uh, start sending uh, you know, the serial data that we were talking about earlier. So this is what it looks like. Um, at this point, if we have control over uh, an app, we can control uh, the dongle and the butt plug. If we have control over the butt plug, we can control the dongle and the app, and so on. Uh, so we actually completely compromise the, uh, the local scenario in the case of the uh, PC app. And it's especially cool because this last vulnerability that I just described actually is absolutely not specific to any of these uh, butt plugs. It's uh, for anything that uses a soft device uh, and on, on that sock. Uh, which is basically everything that uses that sock, and apparently there are a lot of devices that use this old uh, NRF uh, 51822. So we have essentially found a vulnerability that could also be used to compromise every one of those devices, assuming that's configured in, uh, in a proper way, or like a way that is you know, like conducive to exploiting this vulnerability. So uh, that's kind of cool. Uh, finding vulnerabilities potentially, you know, in like maybe smart locks or something like that, just by hacking a butt plug, uh, seems kind of worth it and surprising. Uh, but it is this is the world we do live in at this point. So, question is, uh, we have the ability to compromise the app for the butt plug. What can we do with that? 
Uh, well, this is a, you know, we're still just executing JavaScript inside of uh, the Levins uh, Electron app. The question is, what does that give us? Uh, because it's Levins and that uh, this is running at uh, Medium IL on Windows, it turns out it actually just gives us kind of everything. We can access all the all the files on the on the file uh, on the computer. We can execute arbitrary code, uh, just spawn uh, an exe that, that we want. Um, so we basically kind of compromise the, the computer just by uh, by doing this, um, which is you know kind of great uh, and, and, and helpful for us. Uh, but the question is from there, uh, even if we can create this ransomware that doesn't just infect the blood but also infects the host computer, uh, can we actually make this go kind of viral, right? Because technically we can already compromise a butt plug from a different butt plug or from a different uh, uh, you know, dongle, and that could be something that we can, could be used to like, you know, uh, kind of spread this locally. But it would be better if we could spread it over the internet because you know, obviously there would be uh, much more people that we can reach. Now the question is, uh, how do we do that? Well, there are a lot of these uh, social features in the app, uh, such as the chat-based uh, stuff, and the fact that you can just kind of remotely control a toy. Um, so the question is, how does that interface work? Uh, does that allow us to kind of compromise our remote device? Of course, the answer is going to be yes, but how does it work? Uh, basically, uh, well, that's, that's what I was showing at the, at the bottom left there, is uh, a JSON object that is used to control the, the, the device remotely. Uh, it's going to have kind of like the type of object that it's supposed to be, and then in the, this ID mode is going to give the, uh, the MAC address of the bug plug that's supposed to be controlled, as well as the command, so V means vibrate. Um, and, uh, and that's what's going to be sent over as JSON to, uh, to the remote app. Now, how does the remote app kind of use this? Uh, the thing that we can kind of think about here is that basically if we're able to somehow hijack this into allowing us to send an arbitrary string over to the dongle, we can actually exploit the dongle JSON parser bug in order to get code execution there, then use that to kind of get code execution back on the app. Uh, so it's kind of convoluted, but it turns out it totally works. Uh, the reason for that is that it doesn't actually properly check that the incoming data for like the vibrate command is actually an integer. Uh, it does try to do that check. Uh, if you take a look on the right there, uh, at, the uh, at the top, uh, in the ID mode, uh, it does check that N, which is the incoming uh, vibration uh, you know, strength data, is greater or equal to than zero. Uh, and what that does is that it actually effectively checks that it's an integer that is positive. The reason for that is that if you can take a look on the left there, uh, in JavaScript, if you do 12 is greater or equal than zero, it's going to tell you yes. Uh, even if it's a string, it's going to tell you yes. Now, if it's a string that also includes some text and it's not uh, a number, it's going to tell you no. It's not. That's not going to work. So that's going to block us. That's what makes it such that you can't just arbitrarily uh, inject uh, a command into there. However, uh, if you take a look at the bottom there, it has the exact same check. But instead of checking that n is greater or equal to zero, it's checking that n is not uh, less than zero. And the problem there is. Well, if you check that it's not less than zero, then yes, the string is also going to tell you this, uh, that it, it is not less than zero. But if you then you know, kind of reverse that, it's actually going to tell you it's true, even though it's not an actual string. Uh, well, even though it's not an actual integer. Uh, so it's kind of unfortunate. I'm not sure why they decided to like, flip that test, uh, that test there, like the filter. Uh, but essentially, it means that we can uh, inject an arbitrary string into this command that's going to be sent over to Tongle, and that allows us to send the exact same uh, exploit code that we sent over earlier that allowed us to, uh, to com compromise the dongle for the uh, JSON parser. So basically, the only difference here is that we can just do it over the internet, uh, basically exploit this firmware bug over the internet just because they you know, flipped a, a, a check, which is unfortunate. Uh, so at this point, you know, we have actually our viral uh, bug plug worm. Um, it's going to allow us to kind of uh, compromise the dongle, which allows us to compromise the app, and then we can go from app to app. Uh, the only problem here is that we can only do this assuming that the remote partner has accepted our request to co control our toy. Um, but uh, it turns out we can actually get code execution on the remote app in a much simpler way, which is that they have uh, a chat uh, feature where you just can send text. It turns out you can't just send the text, you can also send HTML. Uh, so kind of sending the exact same thing as before, sending this message, you can pop alert. Um, again, unfortunate, this is kind of a very basic uh, web dev stuff. Because uh, I could find it, and I'm definitely not a web dev. So at this point, we can get code execution just by sending a message. 
so we basically achieved our goal. Uh, this is a payload being that's using. Uh, it's going to both uh, you know, spawn a local process to get code on the actual device, maybe do some ransomware, and then it's going to also send that message to all your friends and create a, basically a, a completely viral uh, you know, exploit there. So we've compromised every node in the network, which is what we want to do. So, uh, you know, yay, go us. And that means that it's time for a live demo. Old tire trying to remember how all this all works. Uh, you can all see this. So uh, please bear with me. Uh, so first thing I'm going to show you is uh, this. I'm going to be actually using the Kelly Jack to kind of like try to hijack a connection between a mud plug and this uh, VM right here. Uh, this VM, which hopefully works. Okay. So this VM is just a regular Windows VM. It's connected to the dongle because uh, VMware lets you do that. And I'm going to turn on this mud plug. I hope you can hear it. <laughs> Um, so this works, it's on, then you can kind of add a toy, it's going to work as well. <laughs> oh wait, shit, I forgot to do something. <laughs> okay, let's start over. Okay, so it connects, that's cool, but uh, it didn't, I, I'm a dumbass. So I actually want to disconnect this because I forgot to start the BTL eject process and that's on the side. Uh, the only reason that we're doing BTL eject in this mode is that it's going to be uh, more successful uh, for live demo, but in theory, well, I mean, not just in theory, actually in practice, you can also hijack an existing connection without having to sniff it while it's happening. So this is just to make things easier. Okay, so now do this again, connect the toy. Hopefully the sniffers are going to detect that connection. All right, we detected a connection on the left there. It's pretty good. Okay, and then we have this app that's connected to our sex toy. All right, so we can actually control it. I don't know if you can hear it. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> stop it. Okay. Okay, right, it stops. From here, we should be able to actually hijack this connection. Uh, the way we do that is. I'm trying to remember this. Oh my god. I used to have a mouse for this, it was much easier. Okay, let me copy this parameter. <laughs> Really sorry about this. I'm going to try and make it faster. All right. T, which means hijack. So I'm going to try and hijack this connection here. And if it works, it should uh, kill the connection in this app. And it should just happen. Okay, so it's trying to hijack it and hijack the connection. So it's great. Thank you, BTLE Jack, for a great tool. Uh, so from here, what you can see is that in here, in the app, it actually disconnected because we now have control over the butt plug from Ubuntu. Uh, so in theory, we should be able to make it, uh, for example, vibrate remotely. Twenty is not vibrate. Twenty. Twenty. Yeah, it's it's actually happening there. Uh, so so that works. It's great. I'm going to put this into DFU mode. Hopefully that also works. It should stop it if it works. There we go. It stopped. Okay, so now it's actually in firmware update mode. So at this point, I take my phone and try and connect it. Hopefully it works again. Uh, yeah. Right. So from here, please don't look at my apps. Please don't send me any messages right now. Uh, so we're going to grab the firmware version. Uh, for the exploit, version 27, it's a lot of work. Uh, and we should be able to say DFU target. So, okay, so now we're going to be flashing this new firmware from our phone. Uh, it's updating. I think I just keep this here for now. From here, uh, what we're going to do, let's see if this works. All right, it's been updated. So now, can do is pull this up and uh, try to connect it back to it. Oh, I think it's doing it on its own. Let's see. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so this works. Uh, I was 
point, we have Kagan code execution on the dongle and then back on the computer. Through this, we downloaded an EXE from the internet and we ran it. Uh, and unfortunately, encrypted our butt plug, which uh, <laughs> is unfortunate. Uh, it's probably from North Korea. <laughs> then, what we can see is uh, I have this other uh, VM which is also running the app. This one is not connected to a dongle or anything, as you can tell. And, but it is connected to the internet and is like my friend. Uh, so, <laughs> Add a message and it just runs the exact same thing. Uh, so we've achieved like butt plug virality. Uh, this effective butt plug. Don't connect to it right now unless you want to, like you know, uh, get your butt plug encrypted. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean that's basically it. Uh, the conclusion. Well, okay. I think there's a couple lessons that we can learn from this, um, which is you know as I mentioned, you know as, as much as this is kind of like a funny line of research. Uh, in my opinion, it is actually kind of important to uh, look at the security posture of different disease devices, not only because it is actually used by people for their livelihoods, but also because, in my opinion, it's kind of a uh, very representative of the current state of you know, IoT and connected devices in general. It's kind of like all these different technologies, which are both new and not new, uh, kind of like working together, and people don't necessarily understand all the implications of like having one vulnerability and one there. Uh, and one component there is that you can kind of start chaining these things and uh, turn you know an XSS into uh, a butt plug firmware. Uh, hack or like uh, a USB dongle app, a hack that should only be possible locally ends up being exposed to the internet and stuff like that. So, you know, hopefully this kind of uh, research applies to other things. Uh, and I wanted to say something else, but I completely forgot what it was. So, uh, I guess thanks for listening. And if you want to find all the code uh, that was uh, in there, uh, go follow me on Twitter. I'm going to post this on GitHub uh, later today if you want to start hacking your own butt plugs. And I do want to thank uh, all my friends who helped me uh, make this, all my friends who also introduced me to uh, the world of connected butt plugs, uh, who are extremely gay. Uh, I'm not going to name names, but you know who you are. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Subscribe, like, and share if you enjoyed this video or learned something and comment below what you found interesting.